will be talking about identifying normal mandibular maxillary landmarks on intraoral radiographs and how to differentiate between normal findings and the disease process on radiographs. Uh, first of all, it's important to understand the difference between what is radio opaque and what is radio lucent. So, um, the radiographic appearances of structures reflect pattern of X-ray photon attenuation. So, based on the attenuation, tissues that attenuate more photons appear more radio opaque or brighter and tissues that attenuate less photons appear more radiolucent or darker. So, based on the radiograph that you are seeing here, you will notice that the radiolucent aspect is the pulp and the radio opaque ones are enamel or dentine or even these restorations for example. The landmarks common to both jaws would be teeth alveolar crest, lamina dura, PDL space, alveolar bone proper, which consists of cancellous bone and the cortical bone. Let's look at the teeth for instance. Teeth are supposed to be heart tissue structures and hence they are radio opaque. The uh, radio opaque part of the teeth are the enamel, the dentine and the cementum. Now the difference between cementum and dentine is hard to differentiate because their mineral content is nearly the same. The pulp on the other hand is a radiolucent part of the tooth which is in the center portion of the tooth. It contains soft tissue and uh, nerves and blood vessels and that explains why it is radiolucent. The radiographic anatomy of teeth as displayed on intraoral radiographs is adequate to detect and evaluate dental heart tissue abnormalities. So for the simplest forms of abnormalities like dental caries, the intraoral radiograph is more than enough to differentiate or to distinguish uh, whether the patient has a caries or not. Moving on to the alveolar crest, uh, the height of the bone or the crestal bone is what is called as alveolar crest. It's the level of the bony crest uh, and is considered as normal when it is about 0.5 to 2 mm apical to the CEJ of the adjacent teeth. So if you were to look at this radiograph, this yellow mark here indicates the CEJ which is the cemento enamel junction. So this is a perfect example of bone loss. So uh, that means this radiograph indicates horizontal bone loss where the actual bone level is seen to be much apical to the normal CEJ. So anywhere between 0.5 to 2 mm of the CEJ is still considered as a uh, uh, normal alveolar bone crest but anything below that is considered as bone loss. So recession or receding of the alveolar crest generally happens uh, with age and also when there is resorption uh, in case of periodontal tissue. So on the other hand the molar radiograph here indicates vertical or angular bone loss. So w when the bone is lost at an angle this is called as vertical bone loss or angular bone loss. So these are radiographs to, to help you differentiate what is horizontal bone loss and vertical bone loss. Next we move on to lamina dura. Lamina dura is an important radiographic uh, uh, entity and it is a radio opaque layer of dense bone. Its visibility depends on the uh, uh, angulation of x-rays. So it's again a very important diagnostic feature. An intact lamina dura indicates that the tooth is vital. The white arrow marks here show you the white line around the tooth which is the lamina dura. And in this case you can see that this is a socket left after extraction of a bone, probably a fresh socket and hence you can see the intact lamina dura. Eventually as bone remodel, this lamina dura, in, in, for example in this edentulous area, will uh, cease to exist and will mix uh, and merge with the normal bone. Periodontal ligament space or PDL is uh, the periodontal ligament which is a, bit a black line or radiolucent space seen between the root and the lamina dura is composed of collagen and hence uh, soft tissue and hence that's the reason why it's radiolucent. Uh, again, our PDL also has uh, a significance when it comes to uh, diagnostic uh, importance. Uh, the widening of PDL at the apex of the tooth indicates apical periodontitis and uh, <clears throat> when we are interpreting radiographs that is something very important to understand. Bone on the other hand is a uh, cancellous bone which is also called a trabecular bone or spongy bone and the cortical bone which is uh, having high mineral content and appears a little more dense and radio opaque. Uh, bone in the maxilla <coughs> is again uh, the pattern of bone is slightly different when it comes to the anterior maxilla compared to the posterior maxilla. In the anterior maxilla you have thin numerous fine gran granular uh, dense pattern of the trabeculae. 
whereas in the posterior maxilla the marrow spaces could be a li slightly wider this is an example of an edential space where the marrow spaces are wider yet more dense in appearance whereas in the mandible the anterior mandible generally has thick coarse and fewer trabeculae which larger marrow spaces and the posterior mandible they are perpendicular trabeculae and large marrow spaces and you can see this pattern of perpendicular lines uh, which is called as a step ladder pattern of trabeculae there's an interesting finding called as cervical bone burnout which i want to bring to your attention here it is diffuse radiolucent areas with ill-defined borders which may be apparent radiographically on the mesial or distal aspects of teeth in cervical areas generally seen between the edge of the enamel cap and the crest of the alveolar uh, ridge uh, this is caused by normal configuration of teeth which results in decreased x-ray absorption in the area in question and this perception results from contrast with the adjacent relatively radio opaque enamel and alveolar bone if that hasn't made any sense then let me show you this radiograph and these radiolucent areas seen at the cervical aspect of the teeth are not actually caries but cervical burnout so this is actually a radio radio uh, radiographic perception because of the uh, differential absorption of x-rays in these areas so moving on let's look at radiographic anatomy in the maxilla we have various radiolucent landmarks and radio opaque landmarks and let's just go through one of them each of them um, individually Let's look at the nasal septum and the anterior nasal spine, for instance. Now, this triangular area or diamond-shaped area is an anterior nasal spine, and this uh, thin bone here is the nasal septum. Moving on, the incisive foramen or the nasopalatal foramen. The nasopalatal canal originates in the anterior floor of the maxillary cavity and exits on the anterior maxilla as incisive foramen, which you can see here uh, on the uh, bone as well as on the radiograph as a radiolucent area. The intermaxillary suture is where the both the halves of the maxilla join in in the center and is apparent is apparent as a radiolucent line on the uh, anterior maxillary radiograph. Lateral fossa is a small depression seen in the lateral incisor area. This is generally seen because there is less density of bone uh, near the lateral incisor and just looks like a fossa. Nasolacrimal canal, as you can see here, well defined, uh, very rarely seen on a uh, canine uh, radiograph, uh, highly placed and clearly evident on the uh, occlusal view here. This is a radiograph to show you the shadow of the nose, which is evident here, and uh, uh, also the floor of the nasal cavity. Also, interestingly, you can see the inverted Y line, which is not apparently visible on this radiograph, but very clearly on the next radiograph. So, the inverted Y line is a radiographic landmark that depicts where the nasal fossa crosses the maxillary sinus. So, you can see here with this black arrow mark here, this is the nasal fossa, and this is the floor of the maxillary sinus. They cross here giving the appearance of an inverted Y line. Nasolabial fold is the uh, fold on the cheek that your is visible and uh, this is the cheek tissue uh, which gives us the appearance of a soft tissue on the um, maxillary radiograph especially in the canine premolar region as a, uh, a, a radio opaque shadow. Moving on to the maxillary sinus, um, <clears throat> this is an important landmark again and in the maxillary posterior region the roots of the premolars and molars are in close proximity to the sinus floor and uh, uh, occasionally infection, odontogenic infection in the maxillary molar roots, especially the palatal root um, can actually inflame the sinus floor and lead to max odontogenic maxillary sinusitis. In an edentulous area, generally the sinus floor dips lower, uh, as visible in this radiograph also. And this is of very uh, important uh, clinical significance, especially when you're going to place an implant in this edentulous area. Uh, and it's important to uh, lift up the sinus floor and make space for the implant. And that process is called as a, that surgery is called as a sinus lift surgery. So this radiograph shows you how this same area, edentulous area, the sinus floor has been lifted up and uh, uh, implants have been made space for an implant. The zygomatic bone 
is the cheekbone and uh, shown with this arrow mark here and you can see this as a radio opaque shadow on the posterior maxillary radiographs and of course the uh, a u-shaped uh, shadow which is the zygomatic uh, process uh, some more images to show you the same zygomatic process and we come to this uh, interesting radio opacity shown by the blue radiograph in a little while and the floor of the maxillary sinus seen here in an edentulous area which is dipping quite low Moving on, you have the maxillary tuberosity indicated by the yellow uh, arrow mark here, which is uh, the end of the maxilla, literally. The uh, pterygoid plates indicated by the uh, black and the white arrow marks here. And this notch-like area, which is called as the hamular notch. The mandible again has some radiolucent and radio-opaque uh, important anatomical landmarks, which we will go through in the coming slides. The symphysis is uh, the uh, is generally only seen in infants. It's the uh, suture which fuses at the end of the first year of the life, and this is uh, the radiograph of an infant, and some supernumerary incisors as well. The genial tubercles are a radio opaque uh, structures seen on the lingual surface of the mandible. Right, this is the prominent genial tubercle seen in an edentulous arch, and the foramen seen this here is a lingual foramen. Uh, which is evident in uh, only certain amount of population and not everyone and uh, this anatomically shows you the lingual foramen and the location of the genial tubercles here. Mental ridge and the mental fossa uh, is indicated the mental ridge is a dense uh, structure here this is the shape of the bone which you can see indicated by these radio opaque uh, lines which is the mental ridge and the uh, radiolucent area is the mental fossa which is seen in this uh, radiograph here right you can also see the lingual foramen in this uh, radiograph mental foramen on the other hand is an important landmark again this is where the inferior alveolar canal exits uh, and the with the nerve endings uh, when projected over the apex of the premolar region it may mimic a peripical disease and hence it's important to note uh, that it's seen uh, somewhere between the premolars and sometimes very close proximity to the apex of the premolar in the mandibular premolar region. Mandibular canal, also called as inferior alveolar canal, indicated with these black arrow marks here. Uh, the inferior alveolar nerve passes through this canal and uh, can be seen even in this uh, radiograph. It can have varied appearances, but it's important landmark to note and again of significance when you're placing an implant in a dentulous area. Submandibular gland fossa is a depression seen uh, in the bone, in the lingual to the uh, the, the mandibular um, posterior region, and right? It appears as a radiolucent area, and it is the area which houses the submandibular gland. These are nutrient canals, which can be seen as radiolucent lines, okay, uh, where you have uh, nutrient canals passing through, and uh, evident not always, but sometimes on the radiographs. Right, so this is the mylohyoid ridge, also called as the uh, uh, internal oblique ridge, which you can see here, pointed out by the blue arrow mark, which is seen on the lingual surface of the uh, mandible and superimposes over the mandibular uh, posterior The external radiograph. oblique ridge, on the other hand, is the extension of the internal oblique ridge upwards through the to the ramus of the mandible, and that is where it is, and you can see it uh, very clearly on all uh, uh, radiographs uh, which is covering the posterior part of the uh, mandible as well as on panoramic radiographs of course. The lower border of the mandible is indicated here you can see it even in the anterior region and the posterior region uh, as a dense uh, radio opaque uh, line. The coronoid process of the mandible uh, is interestingly seen on posterior maxillary radiographs and this is where it is the coronoid process and that's the condyle. Uh, the coronoid is seen on uh, posterior mandibular radiographs as a dense triangular shadow. So uh, that brings us to the end of uh, all the maxillary and mandibular landmarks. So when you are taking a full mouth radiograph, you will be able to put them all together and visualize each and every uh, landmark. It is not essential that all radiographs show you all landmarks uh, that we have discussed here, but essentially majority of them do. Uh, when you are looking at x-rays and uh, looking at uh, radiographs, it's uh, I mean uh, 
landmarks it's important to understand that restorations cast different shadows and uh, are more dense because of the metal content in them and could be less dense if they are made of composite and that's how you see them differently uh, this for example is a root canal treated tooth with a metal crown or, or maybe a PFM crown these are again crowns you can see that this is an implant and these are uh, posts with the uh, root canal treatment done so uh, this is just a radiograph some uh, uh, thought process into it and uh, maybe you can take some time to understand what's happening here maxillary anterior region and there's a large radiolucency here perhaps you can spend some time looking at this radiograph and also uh, an exercise to identify the radiographs you could pause on the slide and try and understand what you're looking at these areas and uh, probably uh, later on give me the answer to this and email it to me All right so uh, that's it for me thank you for listening and uh, these are the references and uh, uh, hope to see you soon and hope you've uh, understood this lecture if there is any difficulty kindly email me